Okay, good evening, and uh, welcome to the final installment in this uh, six-week program here at Sharit Villa. The topic for tonight is the power of persuasion, and one of the things that we all experience in life, all of us, is that others are trying to influence us, persuade us, get us to do what they would like us to do, and get us to think the way they would like us to think. That's something that takes place constantly, every day of our lives. Now many of these people are trying to influence us for our benefit. When our doctor tries to get us to exercise, or our parents get us to do our homework, right? There are people whose influence uh, and persuasion is really for our benefit. It's not for their benefit. When my parents try to get me to brush my teeth, it's not for their benefit. It's for my benefit. If you're really, really cynical, you'll say, well, they don't want to pay big dentist bills. But the <laughs> truth is, at the end of the day, they really have, believe it or not, our best interests in mind. And they want to see that when we're 60 years old, we can chew the food with our own teeth. They're concerned about us. So there are all kinds of people in the world, our teachers, our good friends, our doctors, our parents, right? These are people that they will try to influence us, but it's for our benefit. On the other hand, there are lots and lots of people in our lives, usually as we get older, who are trying to influence us, but not for our benefit, for their benefit. So the advertiser, the salesperson, is not really that concerned that their product is the very best product on the planet for you. Their major concern is selling their product. And whether it's good for you or not, it's not the most important thing to them. A politician is interested in getting your vote. They are campaigning. They would like your vote. They may not be the best candidate for your interests. But the job of the politician is to get votes. And if you're an attorney and you're defending a client, your interest as a defense attorney is not in whether or not your client is guilty. Your interest as a defense attorney, as a counselor, working to defend clients is to get the jury to agree that your client is innocent. And so your job is to influence the people on the jury. Your job is not to try to determine who's right and who's wrong. And so throughout our lives, we're constantly meeting people who are trying to sell us, trying to influence us, trying to persuade us, trying to get us to think the way they would like us to think, trying to get us to act and behave the way they would like us to act and behave, and sometimes the very most dangerous kinds of manipulators are cult recruiters, people that are trying to recruit us into their organization that ultimately may be very destructive to our lives. Now oftentimes the, the downside, the, the result of a, of a faulty decision is not that great. If you buy a $25 gadget that you saw on an infomercial on television, that's supposed to chop and dice and slice and do everything miraculously in three seconds, and you got a lemon, it doesn't really work that well, so you threw $25 out the window. But if you join Jim Jones' People's Temple in the 1970s, there was a very good chance you would have ended up killing yourself. If you joined other groups, there's a very good chance you're gonna be giving them quite a bit of your money and a lot of your time. Things that you probably wouldn't do otherwise had you made a fully conscious, informed decision. <coughs> and so tonight what we're going to try to explore are the ways in which the dynamics in which other people are able to influence our thinking and our behavior. Louis Pasteur, the famous 19th century French scientist, once remarked that fortune favors the mind that's prepared. Fortune favors the mind that's prepared. And therefore, what we're hoping to do in a talk like this is to really become more familiar with the techniques of those people who are out to influence and persuade and manipulate us. Now, who can be influenced? At the end of the day, who is able to be influenced? And the answer is very simple. Every single person on the planet, every one of us is able to be influenced. When? So it's when two things come together when manipulative techniques are brought to bear on people who are vulnerable. When you put these two things together, you have a recipe for disaster. You have a person who is vulnerable 
and they encounter techniques that are designed to be tricky and manipulative and deceptive. And these two basically spell disaster for the person who is vulnerable. What makes us vulnerable? Why are people vulnerable to manipulation or to being uh, persuaded when they ordinarily wouldn't be? So there are a number of factors. One is when we go through periods in our life when we're in a crisis. We go through some kind of a trauma. We go through a transition. We're going through a tremendously anxious time. Imagine that someone loses a close relative. It's a very disturbing kind of experience. Someone goes through a, a, a breakup in a relationship, a divorce. Someone moves to a new city and doesn't know anyone. Someone comes to a new country, doesn't even know the language. They have to find a job. These are situations and transitions in life when you're in a new place and new surroundings and things are very, very out of, not familiar to us. We don't have a normal support system. And then there are times in life when we're going through a personal crisis. We might feel very, very guilty about something. I did something horrible, and I feel very, very guilty about it. I'm not my normal self anymore. I'm walking on eggshells psychically. <clears throat> it could be that we're vulnerable because we are unhappy, just unhappy. I just heard a story very recently where this was the cause of someone's change in life. They were unhappy. Or we're rushed. They did studies recently about all the multitasking that people do these days. They're doing 10,000 things at the same time. They're doing their email and their Blackberry and their everything at the same time and trying to drive a car enough. And they find that people think that they're able to do these things perfectly well. And they usually very much overestimate how good they are at multitasking. But all the studies have been showing lately that people are far less efficient and capable of multitasking than they think they are. So when we're going through our day and we're rushed, and we're doing too many things at the same time, and we're too busy, and we're distracted, we're not really able to put our full attention on what's going on. We can't really pay attention to the efforts that are trying to manipulate us. And it's much, much easier for someone to bamboozle us when we can't really listen carefully and pay attention and focus and try to really see through the scam. A third problem is that there is a pervasive lack these days in critical thinking skills. There was a time in history when rhetoric was taught in school. Public schools, kids would learn rhetoric. They'd learn the basics of how to debate, how to deconstruct an argument, what is logic. Students that grew up learning Talmud don't have this handicap often because they're trained in how to think, how to analyze, how to see when something is not correct, and how to find flaws in arguments. But we're growing up in a world today where people are not trained in critical thinking. It's a tremendous, tremendous handicap when we're not skilled at really being able to analyze and think through what's in front of us. A fourth problem is that we are very unfamiliar with the techniques of manipulators. We're just not aware of the kind of things that they do. So if we're not aware of their tactics, we're at a tremendous disadvantage. And finally, one of the biggest problems is that many of us walk around with a feeling of invincibility. We say to ourselves, oh, I will never be fooled. They're never going to be able to scam me. I know exactly what they're up to. And the more we feel invincible, the more we feel that they're never going to fool us, we're in for a big surprise. Now, the other piece of the puzzle is not just that we are vulnerable at times in our life, but then we meet up with a skilled manipulator, a skilled recruiter. So this combination of me being vulnerable, meeting up with an individual who's a very talented and skilled recruiter, makes it very, very likely that this person may be able to recruit or sell. It's interesting, you should know this, that when you go into a supermarket, Every step you take is analyzed. They know you much better than you know yourself. They're watching when people walk into a supermarket. Do they go right or left? They have sensors and monitoring their eye movements. Do they look high, low, medium? They are following us like mice in a cage. And they're studying our every move. And so they have people who specialize in the placement of products and where to put displays and how high and how low. So these people are very skilled at their craft. They study this in great intensity. Now, what I'll be sharing with you tonight is based largely upon the research of social psychologist Robert Caldini. 
And what he and other people in the field have shown is that one of the reasons that we are most easily manipulated and influenced is that what happens is what's, what gets taken advantage of is our system overload. Our system, our brains are overloaded. We're not able to focus all of our attention on one thing clearly because we have too many things going in our mind. So what happens is manipulators and influencers and persuaders basically take advantage of our brain's inability to think clearly. We should realize that we're living in an increasingly complex world. The world we're living in today is much different than it was 500 years ago. It's even much different than it was 50 years ago. I grew up at a time when there were three television stations when I was a kid. Today, people on the televisions have between 500 and 1,000 stations on the television to watch. I don't know how in the world people figure out what to watch. And they, uh, I just tried researching this recently. I, I remember getting on the internet when it first started, I don't know how many years ago, 20 years ago, 15 years ago. Uh, back then, you could probably manage with something less powerful than a 386. Try operating a, a computer today like you had 15 years ago. Uh, they think that today there are over, probably well over, 155 million websites. I saw some figures that went way beyond that. And interestingly, they think there might be 19 billion pages today on the internet, although Microsoft claims that there are over a trillion pages on the internet. So we're looking at a world where there's just so much information, so much to read, so much to look at, and it's all coming at us. Every day, you've got 100 emails to look at, you've got 25 messages on your Facebook, you've got your Blackberry, and you've got your telephone answering machine. There's just so much information that's bombarding us. We have all these commercials that we see on the street sign, and the newspapers, and the radio, and the television. We're bombarded with information, and with people clamoring for our attention. You know that they design shopping centers so that we'll get lost. It's purposely designed so you won't be able to find your way around easily, so you'll be sticking around longer and maybe seeing their stores. But it's all a game to try to capture our attention, to get us to look at what they want us to look at. I remember when I was a teenager, I saw a wonderful film with Robin Williams called Moscow on the Hudson. He was a Russian musician that defected to the West and, you know, he grew up in a country. I was in Russia in 1990 when it wasn't as bad as when he was living there. But I remember seeing a store, and there was a long line of people in front of the store. And I asked someone on the line, what are you waiting on line for? They didn't know. But they figured if there's a line, there must be something to buy. So they were waiting. And you'd often go into a store, and there was almost nothing on the shelf. I went to a shoe store in the Goom. There were three pairs of shoes on the shelf there. So here, Robin Williams is coming from a country where there was nothing. And he walks for the first time into his life, this wonderful scene, into an American supermarket. And he walks into the coffee aisle, and he's looking, U-Ban, chock full of nuts, Nescafe, Maxwell House, and he's reading brand after brand after brand. And he finally faints and collapses on the floor. He's so dizzy from all these choices. <laughs> so that's the kind of world we're living in. They did a study recently that found that we encounter more information in one week of the New York Times than a person digested in an entire lifetime in the 16th century. We encounter more information just in the newspapers we read during one week of our life than people would encounter over an entire lifetime in the 16th century. And the, the problem is that it's impossible. We can't analyze and digest and look at and consider everything that comes in front of us. We just can't do it all. I know that I have to exercise my option of deleting 90% of my emails. They might look interesting. I just don't have the time. I can't do it all. We have to prioritize. We've got to do these ways, these shortcuts, finding ways to cut through all the stuff that we have to encounter all day long. So what we do is we marshal, we use a technique in our lives. We're not aware of this. But we do something that pilots use when they're flying. You know, if you're driving a car from here to Thornhill, you've got to be very careful. You could have some sugar to pulling out right in front of you. You didn't, you didn't, see, you didn't signal. Right? You've got to be very, very careful. You're going 50 kilometers an hour, 60 kilometers an hour in a vehicle that weighs 2,000 pounds, and it's dangerous. 
So we're driving, and we know that any distraction is very, very dangerous. We know what happens when people are texting when they're driving. It increases the probability of an accident tenfold, twentyfold. So imagine someone is flying a jet plane. So you would think if you have to be careful in a car, so all the more so in a jet plane when you have 300 passengers. So imagine someone's flying from here to Sydney, Australia. That's a very long flight. And you would think they're going to look very carefully to make sure there's no mountain coming in front of them. You know, you've got to steer properly. You can't go. If you go one degree off course, you're going to end up in uh, Japan, not in Australia. So it's tough to fly an airplane, a jet. It's not easy. So we know that it's totally impossible for a pilot to sit there for 17 hours. That's as long as it takes to get to Australia and to sit out the window looking like this flying the plane because their backs are going to get tired, their arms are going to get tired, they're going to get sleepy, they're going to have to go to the bathroom. You can't do it. So we know, thank God, they don't have to sit and look out the window and fly the plane like we drive a car. They have a very handy tool called automatic pilot. An automatic pilot is basically a computer. It's a computer program. And what they do is they program into the computer, we're leaving from Toronto, Ontario. We're going to Sydney, Australia. We're going to fly at, a, at an altitude of 30,000 feet or whatever the altitude is. We're going to go at 500 miles an hour. And these are the weather conditions. And you program the automatic pilot. And believe it or not, it will fly the plane and it'll land the plane. It'll do everything. It's an incredibly handy tool. Now, we all know that we would not be happy if the pilot and the, and the assistant pilot engage the autopilot, and then they came into the back of the plane to watch videos like you did. No one's going to be happy, because we all know that a lot of things can happen. We know that every program, every computer, it could crash. The computer could crash, or the conditions could change. They programmed in that these, these are the weather conditions. They didn't know that over the Pacific Ocean there's going to be a major storm that was unexpected. So you just can't keep the program running the way it was originally. You have to reprogram the automatic pilot sometimes. Or worse things can happen. We know that not only can computers crash, we know that computers can be hacked into. Sometimes our government computers are hacked into. The Pentagon was hacked into. So if they can hack into the Pentagon, you don't think they can hack into a plane's computer system? So it's possible for this amazingly helpful tool to be used against us. And so the pilot doesn't have the ability to just leave the cockpit and come into the back of the plane and take a nap for 15 hours. They've got to watch this automatic pilot very, very carefully. And so what happens is we use automatic pilots for our brain all the time. Because our world is so complicated, because our life is so overburdened with information, we can't sit and look at every little thing carefully. So we use mental shortcuts. We use shortcuts that allow us to sort of get through this information in an easier way. It's like an automatic pilot. But the problem is we often just rely on the automatic pilot. We don't realize that there are people who know that we're using an automatic pilot. And they will take advantage of it and use it against us. So the premise of tonight's talk is that our brain, thank God, has very useful techniques to use to make our life easier. But we have to realize that these are just tools. And if we don't watch these tools carefully, if we don't manage these tools carefully, they can be turned against us. I'll show you a very simple example of this. Everyone see this sign? What did the sign say? So if you say that it said, please keep off the grass, how many people saw that? So that's actually good, even though you got it wrong. That's not what it says, but it's very good that you got it wrong. Why? Because when you think about it, when we first learn how to read, we learn how to read, if you can remember back then, we read one word at a time. Right? Remember you were reading Dick and Jane books? Yeah. You wouldn't read the whole book in uh, 30 seconds. It would take you forever. See the ball. <laughs> See the girl. <laughs> it, it wasn't the way you want to keep on reading. So what happens is as we get older and more skilled, we learn how to read more quickly. And one of the ways that we learn how to read more quickly is that material that we're familiar with, we don't need to read anymore. All of us have seen this sign many, many, many times. 
So once we've seen this sign, we don't have to bother reading the words anymore. We put that sign into our hard drive. It's now something which is there automatically. And you could be driving in a car at 200 kilometers per hour, and the sign looks like a blur. You can't hardly make out the letters. And if someone said, what did that sign say? You say, oh, it's please keep off the grass. Right? So that's an automatic pilot that we each use. But I did something sneaky. I changed the word in the sign. I didn't have this sign saying, please keep off the grass. I once actually, in an experiment, changed it to say, please play on the glass. And people didn't catch it. So it doesn't say, please keep off the grass. Right? You can all see that it says something else. It says, please keep off the the grass. OK, it's not a major distinction. But those of you who read it properly, read it improperly. Right? Because we don't bother reading these words anymore. Thank God. We don't have to bother actually reading everything and checking out everything in our lives because we have a big vault that's our automatic pilot hard drive that's information that's accessible and it's easily accessible because we've been there we did that I don't need to go over that material again there's a very fascinating example of this in the natural world, they observed that on the bottom of this ocean, there's a big fish called the grouper fish. The grouper fish is basically a scavenger fish. It's basically a big fish that, that I'm sorry, that, that, that will eat fish that uh, come into its mouth, or come near it. And uh, they have a very interesting thing that takes place. There is, um, there's a fish that's called the, um, I forget the name of the fish. There's a, a little scavenger fish that comes into the grouper fish's mouth. And what it does is it has a deal that it works out with the grouper fish. Basically, what it says is listen, I'm going to come into your mouth. I'm going to come in, I'm going to clean your teeth. I'm going to eat all the junk and all the garbage off of your teeth. So when you think about it, that's a great deal because the grouper fish is getting free dental treatment and this little scavenger fish is getting free lunch. So when you think about it, this is a wonderful, we call it in biology, a symbiotic relationship. Each one, as we say, ze ze nehene, each one is benefiting. It's a wonderful deal. So when you think about it, what's the problem with this wonderful situation? The problem is you've got to be insane to swim into the grouper fish's mouth because you go in there, he's going to say, I'd rather eat this fish than have dental treatment today. So no one is going to be so foolish as to swim into the grouper fish's mouth. So what happened in this situation was the scavenger fish basically learned to do a dance in the water. They did this little dance where they move around in the water and it's a signal to the grouper fish that I'm coming in here to clean your teeth. I'm not coming in here to uh, do some sightseeing. I'm not coming in here to just go swimming around for recreational purposes. I'm not coming in here just to fool around with my friends. I'm coming in here for a very important purpose. I'm coming in here to clean your teeth. So just give me five minutes. Don't swallow. Don't eat me. I'll be out in five minutes. I'll clean your teeth and goodbye. So this is a wonderful relationship, and that's actually what happens. If you go into the ocean, you'll be able to watch these scavenger fish that have this deal worked out with the grouper fish. They come in, they do this dance, and the dance is very important because the grouper fish doesn't want to waste his time interviewing each fish that comes by. So, no, what are you coming in here for? Doesn't want to bother. This way, it takes three seconds. It sees the dance. It knows, OK, now the guy's come in to clean my teeth. He comes in for five minutes, cleans the teeth, he goes out, everybody's happy. Sounds perfect, right? There's another problem. There's another fish called the saber-tooth blenny fish. The saber-tooth blenny fish is watching all of this going on. And the saber-tooth blenny fish says, look at this. If I learn how to do that dance, I can get into his mouth for five minutes for free. I'm not going to go in there to clean his teeth. Who wants to eat the garbage off his teeth? I got much better stuff to do in there. So the saber-tooth blenny would do, imitate 
this dance, which is basically the automatic pilot for the grouper fish. The grouper fish isn't uh, asking big questions. The super grouper fish has an automatic pilot. It sees this dance. It opens its mouth for five minutes. And the saber-toothed blenny swims in, and he eats the tonsils, and he eats the roof of the mouth, and he eats the cheeks. He has a delicious meal. And then he swims out, and he's laughing. Goodbye. This kind of behavior where basically we make our entire decision based upon a single, isolated, superficial behavior. We don't really deeply analyze. We have like a cue, a signal that's very superficial. It's an isolated feature, one single clue. And we base everything on it, and that's what happens. Normally, it works for us. But many times, it's taken, we, we are taken advantage of. <coughs> There was an experiment that was done at a university. So there was a line of people waiting to make copies on a copy machine, a Xerox machine. And uh, th th they did this 100 times. The person goes to the front of the line and says to the person at the front of the line, can I please get in front of you? I just want to get in front of you. They didn't have 500 copies to make. They had maybe three or four copies. So they found that when they just asked to get in front, about 60% of the people would say, fine, you can get in front, no problem. They did the experiment again. But this time, 100 times the person said, can I please get in front of you? I've got a really, really important doctor's appointment downtown that I'm late for. So now they weren't just asking to get in front. Now they were giving an important reason. So now they found that 94% of the people would say, sure, you can get in front, no problem. That's reasonable, right? It makes sense. If they're just saying, let me get in front of you, OK, 60% are nice people. But here they're saying, I got a very important doctor's appointment. All right, now 93%, 94% say, fine, you can get in front of me. They ran the experiment 100 more times. Listen carefully. Now they just said, can I please get in front of you because I have some copies to make? 92% let this person in. 92% let this person in? What were they thinking? So what happened is their automatic pilot was triggered. What do we learn from the second example? When the person says, I got an important doctor's appointment, we learn that when you give a reason, people are going to be more likely to let you in front of the line. The first person just wanted to jump ahead, just jump into the line. The second person had an important doctor's appointment. The third person, did the third person give a reason? No. But the third person used language that sounded like he was giving a reason. What was the one word that the third person used that gave the impression he was giving a reason? He said the magic word, because. But because I have to make some copies? That's not a reason. Of course he's going to be making copies. What else do you do when you're waiting online in a copy machine? So you see that what happened here is that people's critical thinking was basically diverted and it was overcome by, again, taking advantage of people's automatic pilot, which says to them, if someone gives a reason, I'm going to be more likely to help them. There's another story, an amazing story. Coldini, who I mentioned before, had a friend who had an Indian jewelry store in Arizona. And they received a big shipment of turquoise jewelry right at the height of the tourist season. So they have all this jewelry, turquoise jewelry, at the height of the tourist season, and they couldn't sell any of it. They couldn't sell it. And they were upset. The owner of the store was going out of town. So the owner left the person in charge of the store a note saying, just sell everything at one half. Sell everything at one half. The owner came back a week later and was freaked out, totally surprised to see that all the merchandise was gone. Everything had sold. But then the owner found out that this assistant that was running the store misread the note and didn't put everything at half price, but doubled everything. The price went double. And everything sold out. Why? Because the tourists that are coming to buy jewelry, 
not that tourists are not experts in jewelry. What's good jewelry? What's bad jewelry? How do I know? I'm not an expert. How do I know if it's good merchandise? So the tourists basically went according to a single clue that could be a reflection of whether something is of high quality. We make the assumption that price equals quality. So if it's expensive, it's got to be good. So here, that was engaged. So even though they weren't getting great, great stuff, they were just getting stuff because it was accidentally put at double the price. But they made the assumption, oh, must be good jewelry, sold out. What we're going to do tonight, hopefully in the 25 minutes we have, is look at the six basic areas that Cualdini and other researchers identified as those basic tendencies in human behavior that can be used to generate compliance. Those six areas are reciprocation, consistency, social validation, scarcity, liking, and authority. God's help, we'll try to go through these quickly. Reciprocation is one of the basic rules of human interaction. Societies couldn't function unless we had this rule of society which says, if I do something for you, you really should do something for me. That's the way normal relationships get built. Friendships get built on this principle. It just makes sense to us. We know that it just makes sense. If someone has done so many nice things for us, we should do something good for them. They found, for example, that the group Hare Krishna, that would call itself at many times ISKCON, were able to double the, the donations that they received from people they asked money for. They would ask people for money, begging for money. And at one point, they realized they were able to double the donations. How? By just giving something away for free. Now, what were they giving away for something for free? Nothing. It was a little tiny American paper flag, this big, a, a paper American flag printed on someone's lapel. What was it worth? One billionth of a penny. But it, it engages the principle that if I give you something, you should give me something. Now, that principle makes sense. But what we don't usually evaluate what is, well, did they give me something of value? Is it really worthwhile? So once they engage that rule, the rule actually works. They're taking advantage of this principle of reciprocation. And it doesn't only work when you give people physical gifts. It also involves concessions that we make to other people. I'll give me an amazing example. <laughs> there was an experiment done in the 70s when passerby on the street were stopped and asked, if they would volunteer to chaperone juvenile delinquents at a detention center for a day trip to the zoo, would you be willing to go and take these juvenile delinquents to the zoo for, to the, zoo for the entire day? How many people out of 100 people willing to do that on the street? They found that 17% were willing to do it. Seven, that's pretty good as far as I'm concerned. 17% were willing to take these juvenile delinquents to the zoo for the day. The next group, they asked if they would volunteer as unpaid counselors at a detention center for two hours a week for the next two years. Now, how many people do you think would agree to that? The answer was none. But then they immediately asked these people, would you be willing to chaperone these kids to the zoo for the whole day? And it went up from 17% to 50%. Now 50% were willing to take this activity on that only 17% did previously. Why? Because the person has made a concession. They, they've been reasonable. They've dropped their request. So if they've given me something, I'm going to give back. Right? Now the truth is they've given you nothing. They began by making a ridiculously high request. And then they came down. But you can see how this principle of reciprocation is engaged and it takes place all the time in the world we live in. A second principle of manipulation is consistency. Consistency means that we like to see ourselves behaving consistently, and more importantly, we like to be seen by others as behaving consistently. Weight Watchers uses this principle. It's much more effective for you to declare in front of a group of people, I will lose 10 pounds in the next three months, rather than to have this idea in your head because when you make the declaration in front of a group of people, you will probably try to act consistently with what you've put out publicly. So they found an interesting thing took place. There was a major restaurant in Chicago that had problems with customers who would make reservations and not show up. They had a big, big problem with people who were doing this. 
and they had a big no-show rate. So the manager of the restaurant discovered a way of reducing the no-show rate by 30%. He knocked it down by 30%. How? What they did was when previously, when people called to make reservations, they would say, please call us if you change your plans. That's all they would say. Please call us if you change your plans. Now the manager had people say, will you please call if your, ch if your plans change? Not just requesting, please call us if you're not going to be coming. They said, will you call if you change your plans? Then they would stop and pause and wait for the person to answer. And everybody would say yes. Well, once they made that statement publicly that I'm going to behave in a certain way, they wanted to behave consistently with the way they acted originally. And the no-show rate diminished by 30%. At Bar Ilan University, they were able to sh show that uh, donations for a handicapped charity in certain neighborhoods were able to be doubled. They were able to double the donations they received for this organization helping people with handicaps. How? Two weeks before they went asking for the donations, they would ask people to sign a petition supporting the rights of the handicapped. So once a person made an action, did something, in the direction of being concerned about the handicapped, they wanted to act consistently with that, and donations doubled. There was an incredible study done in California. They asked homeowners in California, in a beautiful area with expensive homes, would you be willing to put a billboard with a public service announcement in your front lawn? Imagine you have a beautiful house here in, in Toronto, and someone asks you to put up a billboard right, with some public service announcement on your front lawn. Very few people are going to say yes. They found that 83% of the people asked said no. 83% no, I'm not going to do that. But 76% of another group that was asked the same question said yes. Why would it go from basically 17% to 76% and increase? Because the second group, the second group that went up to 76% had been asked three weeks earlier, would you be willing to put this little sticker, this little bumper sticker in your window saying, please drive safely? Everybody was willing to do that. Everybody said, sure, I'll put up a little sticker in the house. Well, once they were willing to take an action which basically said, I am civic-minded. They made an action, I'm civic-minded. They wanted to act consistently with that. And so then the chances of getting people to put the big sign in their front lawn increased dramatically. A third principle of manipulation is social proof. Social proof, we all understand it. We do it all the time, every day. I once went downtown in Toronto here. There's a mosque. I had to visit a mosque. I've never been in a mosque before. I don't know what happens in a mosque. I walk in, and there's a vestibule. And in the vestibule, I see 200 pairs of shoes. So I say to myself, I suppose, in the mosque, you take your shoes off before you walk in, right? I didn't want to be the only person in this place wearing my shoes. So we have this principle, monkey see, monkey do. And I take off my shoes and I walk into the mosque. But this is something that makes sense. The principle is, if you don't know what to do, look around and see what everyone else is doing and pick up the social cues. If you go to a wedding in Indonesia that you've never been to before, you don't know what they do there, you don't want to make a fool out of yourself. You don't want to get embarrassed, so you don't know what to do. Look around and see what everyone else is doing. We do this all the time. We're not even aware of it. But we do it all the time to know what to do. When we don't know what to do, we just look around. Yet Solomon Ash found in the 1950s in a famous experiment, he asked university students to look at these lines. He wanted them to compare this line to the other three lines. He wanted them to say which of these lines, A, B, or C, is the most similar to this test line. Now, if you look at it carefully, it's quite obvious that the answer is C. But when they had a group of students who all gave the wrong answer, so you were sitting in a room where all the other students gave the wrong answer, Ash found that 75% of the subjects would go along with the rest of the group. Even though their eyes told them that C is the correct answer, if everybody else is saying that it's A or B, we're more inclined to say, you know what, it's impossible to believe that everybody is wrong. I'm the only one that's right. 
So it's more likely people are going to say, you know what, they must be right. They're the majority. When people watch comedy shows on television, this principle is engaged against them. If you're aware of the comedy shows, 95% at least used canned laughter. Canned laughter is based upon this principle. They've done experiments where they take a television show without the canned laughter. They just show the, the footage raw to an audience. They have the audience vote, how funny is this program? And they might rate a 50 out of 100. They take the same program, the same comedy show, and now they plug in the fake laughter, the canned laughter. You should know, by the way, canned laughter is not a recording of people laughing and clapping and giggling. It's not human beings. There are sounds that are mechanically produced by a machine to sound like people who were clapping and giggling and clapping and laughing. So what happens to your brain is you're watching this show and your brain says, oh, everybody's laughing. It must be funny. The fact of the matter is no one is laughing. You're being manipulated into thinking people are laughing because they're playing this fake laughter. And so when they asked people to rate these shows with the canned laughter, the shows went from a 50 to an 80% that was funny. Because people, again, their, their idea of social proof was being engaged. I once went to a uh, recruiting session. A friend of mine had joined a group called EST. EST it was a very popular mass therapy group in the 1980s. And uh, they had a recruiting seminar at Madison Square Garden in New York. 10,000 people showed up. 5,000 people here are members of EST, people who were asked to bring their friends and relatives to this graduation exercise so that they could recruit us. And I remember going there and sitting through this long 45-minute speech by Werner Erhard, the founder of EST, and they did something very interesting. Every five minutes he would stop speaking, and all the people that were there that were part of the group would clap. They'd all clap. And normally, if you go to a lecture, and it's a great lecture, you'll clap at the end. But here, every five minutes, they're clapping. Now, if you're in a group with 5,000 people clapping, the chances are, what are you going to do? You're going to clap like everyone else. I was the only person, there were 10,000 people there, I'm sitting like this. And I'll tell you, I, I did it on purpose, and I knew exactly what I was doing, but it was very, very difficult to have 9,999 people around me clapping their heads off, and I'm sitting like a fabissant guy like this. But I knew exactly what they were doing. They were trying to get me to do something I wouldn't ordinarily do. I wouldn't ordinarily clap after five minutes, every five minutes. So they wanted me to clap simply because everybody else is clapping. To do something that the group is doing just because the group is doing it. And if they can get me to make that motion, that movement, that commitment, they can engage this other principle of consistency. Once I'm consistent, once I'm doing something, I want to behave consistent with that. This is the way the Korean War veterans were able to be brainwashed by their, by their Japanese cap by their Korean captives after the Korean War. They took American servicemen and they got them to write statements that were treasonous statements against the United States. How? If they had asked them from day one, we want you to sign this statement denouncing the United States, they wouldn't get anyone to do it. So they got them to do something innocent. They would say, please just write on a postcard your name and address. All right, that's innocent. They got people to do it. They shouldn't have done it. They're not required to do it. But the soldiers felt, OK, what is the big deal? We wrote something, our name down on a piece of paper. But once they get me to be compliant on an innocent thing, it's much more easy to get me to be compliant on the next thing and then the next thing. Another principle is the scarcity principle. The principle is very, very commonly seen on late night television commercials. Scarcity means that for me, something becomes more valuable if it's less available, if it's more scarce. They did an amazing study at bars. They would ask people to rate the attractiveness of the opposite sex at the bar three hours before closing time, two hours before closing time, and a half hour before closing time. <laughs> Guess what they found? That the closer they got to closing time, the more attractive the other people looked. It's an amazing thing. They're the same people. But they look more attractive because they're less available now as we get closer to the closing time. They did a study at the University of Florida where they asked students to rate the food in the cafeteria. They rated the food. A few weeks later, they asked people the same exact question, but they told the students that because of a fire, the food would not be available in the cafeteria for the next two weeks. 
the ratings went much, much higher. Same exact menu, same exact food. Why? It was less available now, more scarce. So we're going to try to do two more principles in the next five minutes. So please give me your attention. Another very important principle is the principle of liking. If I like you, I'm more likely to do what you would like me to do. And this is one of the most important techniques that salespeople use. Salespeople want us to like them. Well, how do you get someone to like you if they don't know you from a hole in the wall? You never met the person. So salespeople do very, very simple things. They might compliment you. Oh, that's a beautiful dress you're wearing today. I like your hairdo. Very simple things to say that they may not mean at all, but by flattering people, we begin to like them. They may get your name and then use your name a few times. They found in studies, by the way, that if you use the person's name one or two times or three times, that could work. You use it more than two or three times, they feel you're trying to manipulate them. It doesn't work. It backfires. But there are many, many ways in which people are able to get you to like them. One of the simplest ways is by giving the impression that you're just like them. I remember I had my first car was a yellow Datsun B210. What would happen? I was a teenager. Every time I passed another Datsun on the road, what would happen? Hey, wave and honk. The guy could be a Nazi. But I'm waving and honking because he's got the same car. He must be a great person, just like me. So what the salesperson wants to do is give you the impression they're just like you. So what salespeople will do is find things out about you. They might come to your office to sell life insurance, and they might see you on a picture on a fishing, fishing expedition. And they might talk about the, they love to go hiking, they love to go outdoors. They don't want to be so obvious to say, oh, fishing, I love fishing. If you're coming to bring your used car to, to get another used car, and they open up the trunk and they see tackle equipment in the back, so they might say, oh, I can't wait. In a couple of weeks, I have my vacation. We're going to go to Algonquin Park and do some camping. They're trying to say, you're an outdoors person. I'm an outdoors person. They might ask you where you're from. And you might say, oh, I'm from Florida. You say, Florida? My grandmother lives in Florida. Where are you from? I'm from New York. New York. My kid goes to school in New York. Where are you from? I'm from California. California. My sister is teaching in university there. Where are you from? I'm from Ottawa. Ottawa. My uncle used to live in Ottawa. Do you realize that it, no matter where you're from, they could just very well say they know someone from there. And again, it sounds like a very cheap thing. It's not insignificant. No, it's significant. Because if you have something in common with these people, you're more inclined to follow their lead. What they've done, which is amazing, is high-tech studies of how to convince people that you're just like them. So what people will do is they will mirror your body language. I remember Carol, who I work with, once came in, she had a sore throat after the weekend, and she came, Carol was speaking to him like this, oh, God, it's, it's Monday morning, and what are we gonna do? And after a half hour of speaking with Carol, I said, what am I whispering for? <laughs> because this is what people do. We basically mirror the people that we're with. They did a study, they would watch a couple, for example, who were very deeply in love, let's say they're out for their wedding anniversary dinner, and they would notice that if one person let's say, leans over, the other person would lean forward. If one person crosses their legs, the other person crosses their legs. If one person lowers their voice, the other person lowers their voice. This is a principle that if we really like people, if we're in sync with them, we tend to act as a mirror to them. So if you meet someone that you don't know from a hole in the wall, one of the easiest ways to get them to like you is to mirror them. Because their brain says, hey, this person I like, they're just like me. And this is a very powerful technique that we're able to lead people with this kind of mirroring. So it's very, very possible to basically manipulate people in ways that they're not even aware of. Neuro Linguistic Programming, NLP, uses eye accessing cues. Because if I want to influence you, I have to be able to use your map of reality. If you're a person that tends to be more visual than kinesthetic or more audio than visual, meaning that the way you think and the way you speak is that I see what you mean. Oh, that looks good to me. You're a visual person. If you say, I hear what you're saying, that rings a bell, you're audio. But how do you know if someone's visual or audio or kinesthetic? They like to think through their hands and their touch. So if you listen to them for an hour or two, you'll hear it in their language. But if you're a salesperson or a manipulator, you don't have an hour. If you don't be able to build a bridge within two or three minutes, you're finished. So they learn eye accessing, eye accessing cues where they can see people who are visual with, when they're asked certain questions, their eyes move up. And if they're audio, their eyes move side to side. And if they're kinesthetic, their eyes move down. So now within a 30 seconds, I can know your map of reality and how to get the key into your brain. And if you're an audio person, I'm going to pitch everything to your ears. And if you're an, a visual person, I'm going to pitch everything to your eyes. So if I'm selling you a house, 
I'm going to talk about, take a look out the window and look at this beautiful view. And can't you just see your kids playing and having a good time? I'm going to give a whole drusha to your eyes. But if you're an ear person, I'm going to talk to your ears. Walk on this floor. You can't hear a crack. What an incredible floor. And can't you just hear your kids screaming in the backyard and having a great time? We're able to tailor our presentation to the person if we know the key into their brain. One final technique, which is authority. Authority basically says that we respect and we listen to people in positions of authority. I remember when I was a kid, they were selling uh, decaffeinated coffee. The salesperson on a TV commercial was Robert Young. And they did very, very well with their product. Who was Robert Young? He played Marcus Welby, MD. Uh, play, he, he wasn't even a doctor. He played a doctor on television, but he comes on the commercial with a white lab coat, and they found that people gave him credibility. If you're a little kid that's lost on a street somewhere, who's the first person you should walk up to? You don't go up to any stranger. It would make sense. Go up to a police officer. So again, does it make sense that I can trust the police officer more than a random person? Yes. But in New York City, the way people get robbed is a police officer knocks on their apartment and says, we're investigating robberies, and the people let them in, and the police officer robs them because they're wearing a fake uniform and a fake badge and a fake hat. So it's true that people that really have authority, if he's really a doctor, if he's really a rabbi, then you have to give them some credibility, but they may be faking it. I'm going to end with an experiment. I'm going to ask... Uh, <laughs> Rachel, please come forward. We're not related or anything? No. We haven't discussed this before? No. Okay, so you can stand at your seat. And I'm going to ask Toby to do the following. I have an article here about uh, the superbug that rises with new antibiotics, etc. This is an article from the newspaper. You'll be able to see it in a minute. It's a real article. It's not a fake article. Every line is different. I'm going to ask you to just tell me when to stop. I'm going to move the scissor down the paper. And I'm going to ask you to tell me when to stop. Stop. I'm going to ask you to pick up the paper. Whoops. And just read the top line to the audience. Have grown about the increase. One more time, nice and loud. Just the first line. Have grown about the increase. Have grown about the increase. Rachel, you want to open up the paper, the envelope? This is a prediction I made earlier in the day. Toby, are all the lines different? It's a, it's a real article? Yeah. And you had free will as to where to tell me to cut? Yes. OK. What is the prediction? Have grown about the increase. Have grown about the increase. So if I've convinced anyone in the room that I have psychic abilities, there may be a chance that you would come to my seminar at the North York Public Library on Sunday and pay about $300. It's a possibility. I might convince some people in the room that I have these powers. And so people that demonstrate that they have power or knowledge may be faking us out. The conclusion of today's class is basically very simple. Knowledge is power. And that if we're aware of the mental shortcuts that we use and how compliance professionals take advantage of these mental shortcuts, we're less likely to be influenced, persuaded, and manipulated. Thank you all very, very much. Have a good night.